I am something of a dinosaur. I went to KSR and incorporated as a game designer in 1982. Went to work uh, creating adventures for Dungeons and Dragons and being back there. Was in awe of the area. And I thought that I would be a game designer forever, which is why my name comes second in Y That was not the case. My destiny was to become a storyteller. More than just a storyteller, I found the idea of a story and breaking down a story into its components, deconstructing story to be something that absolutely fascinated me, especially as it relates to a game environment. Gaming environment is a strange place. A good friend of mine, uh, Richard Garrett, who designed the Elfin series and who recently spent an awful lot of money and went to the International Space Station. By the way, there will be a side from time to time, and this is the first. Not only am I an international and New York Times bestselling author, I am also the screenwriter and the editor of the first science fiction movie filmed in space. And I did this with software. <laughs> Richard Garriott was going to the International Space Station. He called me up and said, I want to do something fun while I'm up there. I said, well, why don't you make a movie? <laughs> and so I created for him a PowerPoint presentation that contained the script for a space epic film that he could make while he was on board. And so he recruited one cosmonaut and two astronauts. <laughs> The cause, and I was so proud of his English. We had to subtitle him anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and he actually filmed this in space after he, uh, after he came back, re entered in the, in the uh, Soyuz capsule. They flew him to Star City, Russia, where he immediately uploaded all of the raw video to me in South Jordan, where I edited it together. <laughs> It's called Apogee of Fear. It's about five minutes long. Anyway. <laughs> story. Why story? William Goldman says that story is structure. And that is why I look at the structure of story. But what I say is that story is meaning. Story is the answer to the question why. Story is the way that we think. It is hardwired in humanity. It's how we find meaning in the chaos that's around us. I'm driving in here this evening. I'm behind this old woman and her little smaller old husband in the car, and they are driving at 20 miles an hour. And there is no way I'm getting around them on 13 feet. And so I, the righteous warrior attempting to come here and impart my wisdom to you, I'm frustrated by this evil old woman who, for her own nefarious purposes, has decided to drive with this ridiculous train. <laughs> when we, in truth, if you want to look at it in terms of the cosmic nature of the whole thing, it's really mostly a matter of fluid dynamics, how things track and go. But to me, from my perspective, I must find meaning in this random thing. And when there is no meaning, I will fill it in with story. This is why computer games largely work. Because you create map, not territory. You create simulation, not reality. And it is up to the user then to make that leap into meaning, to provide his own story. None of us who have played any of Sid Meier's Civilization games have ever seen ourselves as anything but a benevolent, or maybe not, ruler. <laughs> in the structure of games, when I first came into uh, TSR, I came in and desired very much to bring story into games. Because at that time, back in those ancient of days, right after Steam, 
when you were playing role-playing games, it was largely a matter of kill the monster, take its stuff, buy bigger weapons, kill bigger monsters, get more stuff to buy bigger weapons. And that was the sum meaning of the game. But I wanted more than this. I wanted meaning. So we took a look at game structure. And what we found is that there were essentially two approaches at the time. One was what we called the linear approach, where you start the game, and then you are dragged by the nose and pushed, shoved, however, to B, and then you go to C, and then eventually you get to D. And if you live long enough, maybe E. This particular structure is a linear structure. You know this structure. This is a grab them by the nose and drag them down the path structure. Most people, when they want to do story, they want to do this because it's very simple to drag somebody down a plot. This is very good for tournament gaming. This is very good for evaluation gaming, where you need to determine who gets furthest along and wins by how far down this chain they go. But this particular linear design sucks from a gamer's standpoint. Gamers know when they're being dragged down. They do. So maybe we don't want linear gaming. Maybe we want um, we want we want to be free. Everybody wants to be free. You want to go wherever you want to go. You want to do whatever you want to do. So you start here at A, and maybe you go to B and C. Maybe over here to D. You can go down here to D, maybe. Maybe uh, F's nice too, but then from F, of course, you've got to go here, here, and here, and you see the mathematical progression that we have here in terms of design. All of a sudden, you have this explosion, this exponential explosion of area and, and creation and, and construct. This is an open design, a radial matrix that grows exponentially. And very quickly, you find yourself designing stuff that is way too big, full of areas where the gamer is never going to go. Nobody wants this. First of all, it's a waste of programming time and design time. And what's more is it has no direction. It has no point, no purpose, no flaw. Usually when we talk about when we talk about plot, we talk about rising, tension, and plot, climax, and then resolution down here. And so you have this climbing and this, this, this falling at the end and this, and this resolution at the end. This is a classic kind of a construct for plot. We're going to give you a new construct for plot tonight. So if you're doing this, it isn't going in any particular direction. You cannot portray plot or meaning in a radial matrix. So, being confronted with this and wanting to design a game, a role-playing game, that had a story in it, we needed to come up with a construct that had flow, but that also had the illusion of choice. And so what we came up with was, you would start with it. We could just start somewhere. And it's almost always a tavern. <laughs> we talk a lot about the grand argument, or not the grand argument, but we do talk about the grand argument. So we talk a lot about the Campbellian monomyth and the mythic cycle that Joseph Campbell talked about in his um, in his view of the thousand faces. Wonderful, wonderful structure. And In his structure, you always start at home. So maybe that's why the tavern is where everybody begins. Anyway. <laughs> so what we went, what we did from here is we conceived the matrix in this way. So what we had here was a directed matrix. A matrix that had flow to it, that would open up uh, with, the, with the character's motion and the character's decisions. But you would get to the point at the boundary 
level on the outside of this directed matrix where it would bounce them back toward the center of the matrix, where it would move them back into the general area of the plot, if you want. Well, this, these boundaries here came in two flavors, actually. They came in like the soft boundary <coughs> flavor over here, and they came beyond that was the hard boundary. In game terms, you're, a, you're an adventure party, you're on the road. The, the, uh, the referee of the game tells you that there's a beautiful, shiny castle across the valley to the east. The road leads across the beautiful bridge to the tower and the castle to the east. And of course, you want to go west. So <laughs> <laughs> you travel down the road to the west, and, and you come to a fork in the road. One goes to the north, one says, fine, go to the north fork. Go up there, and there is there is a rider who is coming down that road, and he's exhausted, and he falls off of his mouth at your feet, and he says, I have a message, an important message for the king in that castle to the east. <laughs> <laughs> this is an informational soft boundary that's redirecting into the center of the matrix. And of course, where do they go? West. West, of course they do. <laughs> Then they get to the way, and there's a battle that's going on there, a horrible battle that's going on there behind the lights, and our, our valiant warriors are being defeated by the terrible hordes that are coming through the pass from the west. And we, of course, try to cross the lines and go west. <laughs> this is the point where you reach the hard boundary where they die. <laughs> I do like the shirt, by the way. Yeah, it's wrong. <laughs> My experience has generally been that characters kill characters just by doing stupid things. <laughs> so, this structure then, what we call a directed matrix, or a limited matrix, allows for a playing field in which the characters can react in which the players can make their choices. Our assumption, however, is that there comes to a point out here on the fringe where their choice is stupid. <laughs> and they either demonstrate survivable behavior or they don't. <laughs> I'm all for keeping my character alive, but seriously. <laughs> So this was the this was the matrix structure that we came up with in order to, to move through. Because you do, you come down here and you eventually can come down to a series of endings, good or bad or dead, where the where the player feels that they have had their choice. It's also important for the player that these boundaries here be invisible in the sense that they always need to see beyond this boundary that there is more, that they and always have the sense that there is something just over the horizon, that there is something more than what's in the code, that the world is huge beyond the horizon. And they will assume that unless you tell them because they want that. It's part of their internal story. They want this to have some meaning. Now, the strange thing is that we created all of this story structure for gaming. We created this at PSR back in the early 80s. This has all been lost. Because everyone who created this is no longer part of the company. And these kinds of games are no longer being made. So this technology has actually, I mean, I'm the relic, the dinosaur that carries all of this forward as a way to tell story in game. Because as long as you have this flow, this general move movement in this direction, 
and you can build points in here that will mimic these points in storage. Yes? I was going to say, uh, are you really sure it's gone and not just evolved? Because I see it's stuff like this all the time. It is evolved. In my gaming, it's, it's gone. Uh, in your gaming, it is evolved. And is evolved. Yeah. But here, and now that you've got this, this is, that's not going to do with what I want to talk about. Now. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's not true. It has a great deal to do with what's, what's going on. What I want to talk about tonight. What I want to talk about tonight is the, root of, the roots of story in terms of meaning. The dramatic theory of story states that a complete story represents the human mind working through a problem, evaluating it from all sides, and then determining whether the results are good, positive, or bad, negative. And a complete story works through that entire argument. The reason why this is important is because it is being used against you today. And one of my messages for you here today is to be aware of that. As I very often tell people, I no longer watch the news because I know fantasy when I see it. <laughs> Back in about 1967, 1968, somewhere around the time when 60 Minutes started, Prior to it was an evolution in news reporting. Prior to that time, news divisions in broadcast systems were prestige divisions. They were loss divisions. They did not make money, and they were not expected to make money. They were there to present to, to, present to the public a public service mandated, I believe, by the FCC at the time to provide information to the public. News information. But right around 1967, 1968, 60 Minutes came along, and they, they discovered that if you repackaged news in a story format, that you could communicate meaning. And people would pay for meaning. And so it moved from the part where where Perry White would tell Jimmy Olsen to go out and get the facts, kid. To go out and get the story. Very often in journalism, they talk about this as slant. But what it really is, is a slant on propaganda. It is the ability to pre-think for you through an argument. And that is why the news is presented as story today. Years ago, I went to the CNN uh, CNN tour, and when I was in Atlanta, and I looked at the brochure, and on the cover of the brochure it said, the story behind the news. And I thought, they really know what they're saying? Story. Story is powerful. Story motivates. Story changes the way we think. Story changes the way we I was sorry about that, and we made it to that. Mm. Yeah. Now, by the way, here's my plug. I, I teach story online. I have, a, I have a website where I teach story structure online. It's uh, scribesforge.com. We'll talk about that later. Story is key. So, how do, we, how do we get to this meaning? We get to this meaning by having a full set of characters and their proper relationship to, to plot. And this is different, probably, than you have considered it before. There are, in fact, in plot, four through lines. Four what lines? These are through lines. The 
only I can spend. Four through lines. These through lines run through the length of the story and represent four different perspectives. The first is the objective. <coughs> This objective through line is the story as though it were being seen from the outside, or if you will, from way above the events. Um, let's say for our purposes today, this is the uh, Normandy invasion, World War II. Titanic forces is coming together, fighting, trying to gain a control. It's the objective story. Next, we have the main character's story. And the main character's story is the story as seen through the eyes of the main character. It's his personal story, his perspective. Here at the bottom, we're going to put. An impact character. Now, the impact character is this working for you? It's very silent out there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, as long as you're not sharpening pitchforks, I'm probably all right. So, <laughs> objective. This is the story to see from Bobo. Story. Okay. Main character story. Let's say, because it's fun for me, okay, that we're doing Private Ryan. Okay, who is the main character in Private Ryan? Yeah. Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks' character. Oddly enough, it's not Private Ryan. You'd think, you know, with the big title and everything, but no. Okay, this is going to be Tom Hanks, the captain, whose name, of course, escapes me when I need it. This is his story. Okay? The war at, in Normandy as seen through his eyes. This is the impact character, and this is something people will often consider. And this is where it's going to be of some help, I hope. The impact character is that character who has the most impact on the main character. If we were talking about Star Wars here, but the objective story is what? It's the Star Wars. Yeah, it's the Empire of the Rebellion. It's on the title, and it's hard to miss. Okay, who is the main character? Yes, episode one, please. Three, four, whatever it is, the first one we came out. Number four, which was the first one. Okay, fine. Main character? Luke. Luke, how hard is that? Luke, okay. Who is the impact character? Who changes him the most? Obi-Wan. Oh, man. Obi-Wan. Because he is the one who changes him the most. And this. Vader gets it in episode five. I'm sorry? Vader gets it in episode five. Yeah, I get it later, later, later. So, so, what we have in between here is the fourth perspective. And this is the subjective story. Subjective story. This is the story that takes place between the main character and the impact character. It is their personal struggle. In Private Ryan, it is Ryan. And the subjective story is here, finding him in the beginning and then what to do with him when he won't leave. This brings up, the, this is the emotional story. This is the emotional story, okay, between the two of them. In terms of the objective story, okay, which may actually not be normative, but maybe the mission itself, okay, does the mission succeed? Yes. Yeah, they get him out. But for Tom Hanks, it's a failure, he dies, which makes it a tragedy. <clears throat> Okay. But it has shown sacrifice as being more important. 
That's the message here. And which is why I cry at the end of the movie, you know, when the guy says that I live a good life. Am I a good man? So, these four lines move through the story. And it is these four lines that create the meaning for the person who is experiencing the story. My analysis, yes, please. So if we have a story like Star Wars, which you can divide it in different episodes, every episode ha can have a specific impact character, a subjective, a main character, and then if you analyze it the whole, you can have those two? Or if you analyze the whole, this is, I deal with this a lot actually with people who, who uh, work in trilogies. <laughs> <laughs> And we have J.R.R. Tolkien to thank for the trilogy, not because he wrote three books, but because he wrote such a fat book <laughs> that Alvin Mifflin could publish it all in one piece. And so they asked him, please, to cut it into three pieces. Lord of the Rings is actually one book. They just found somewhere to cut it up into three pieces. But the rest of us have been saddled with this whole trilogy idea ever since. So when we're dealing with trilogies, or or quadrilogies or whatever set whatever anyway theories yeah a bunch <laughs> what you're going to have is you're going to see a ideally if it is done right and Star Wars probably did probably I'd have to do a, 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 an analysis of it you would have these four through lines run through all six films and the journey. Okay. The objective is the universe, Star Wars, the, okay. The main character in this particular case actually becomes Vader because he, it becomes his story moving all the way through to the end. And then you have an impact character in here who, oddly enough, is still Obi-Wan. He's getting a lot of play. <laughs> okay. And in this particular case, it's a cycle of, it is a cycle of falling and redemption. Star Wars, the major six volume set. But when you then, but then within that structure, in each of the films, like you're saying, you then have its own structure that needs to support that. I just did a, I just did a book series for, uh, a, a, called Dracus. I'm about to write the third book in the Dracus series. It's a trilogy. And the thing about these in the dramatic theory, when you get down deeper into it, it deals with very specific structures and how they progress. And one of the structures deals with time where you deal with the past, you can deal with the, uh, well, let's see, in that case, it was future, past, and <coughs> present, okay? And while I have these aspects moving through all three books, the first book dealt with the future, the second book dealt with the past, and the third book dealt with present concerns. And so the structure reflected downward in these different components overall structure for meaning throughout, and an individual structure for supporting meaning in the individual segments. Now, <laughs> I just wanted to do that. <laughs> <laughs> there are, still with me? Because I am really moving fast. There are eight Character types. Sorry. I want you to do this game when you go, when you leave here. Your game, people, you'll enjoy it. Watch a television show, go to a movie. Go to a movie preferably, or pick any of your favorite films if you want to. Do this with your spouse, companion, whoever you like, friend, okay? And see how many characters there are. 
in almost every film, you will find eight main characters. And they can almost always be slotted into these slots. Yes? I'm going to say, uh, those four path lines that we have here. Yes. Could you not, in some cases, add S onto the end of them? Like, let's say instead of a main character, it's more of a main character group. It tells, you know, uh, four well, squares. Well, one of the, one of the things about characters here in this particular theory mm -hmm. is that characters can be groups. Okay. Um, and I'll so show you right here, be, for example. Then they could also be, say, objects or settings? Possibly, yes. Okay. Here are the eight. And they're grouped into two sets of four. The first set are the driver characters. And the second are the passenger characters. Drivers, four. Passengers, four. And when we say driver and passenger, we're actually referring to this plot. Driver characters are always engaged in the objective plot. They are moving the objective plot forward. Passenger characters, on the other hand, are being brought along for the ride. Red shirts, yes, they can certainly be found down here <laughs> for short periods of time. <laughs> <laughs> These people are involved in the active plot. Okay? So, I'd love to do this with you, but I'm going to just charge ahead because. You need help? No, you know what, though? That is, that's... <laughs> as long as you sure. Yes, okay, fine. <laughs> I, I, I need eight characters over here. Come on. Sure, I'm ready. Okay. All right, right over there. Stand everybody over there. I know, everybody's over <laughs> now this is more fun. It is. It's more fun. And you guys are a fun bunch, so why not? Okay. Here we go. Yeah, we know how this is going to work. All right. Here we are. There are, and I'm going to go ahead and put these on here. This is better that way. There are four driver characters. These are protagonist, yes, I'm sure we've all heard of him, her, whoever. Okay, dynamically opposed to protagonist is the antagonist. Oh, you're so good. <laughs> this is a guardian character. A guardian character. And guardian characters are always weak. Because if they were strong, they would fix the problem for the protagonist and we'd all go home. Opposite this character is a character, it's a new term for you, possibly. Contagonist. The opposite of a guardian. This is the person with their own agenda. This is the anti. The ant well. On occasion. Mm, no. This is the person who is, um, it's the emperor. is behind the scenes trying to manipulate things. He's the Han Solo. He has an interest. Maybe. Well, it's like that's just so it's okay. <laughs> contact is up here. We're going to find out more about that. Actually, contact is easiestly described through example, which is why we're going to go through all of this. Uh, down here, we're going to put a sidekick. <laughs> and we're not talking Gabby Hayes. This is actually something different than just the jolly person who says everything's fine. This is a person that represents hope and support and faith. Okay? Opposite then you have a skeptic who represents no faith in anything at all. Then you have emotion and reason. It's logical. <laughs> Damn it, Jim! 
<laughs> um, there's, these are dynamically opposed. Okay? These characters are passengers, meaning they are pulled along by the objective, by the objective plot and what's going on. They got no control over this. Here we go. These people on the other hand are directly affecting the objective plot. So, having said all of that, and having done my paper craft up here, we're going to just, uh, well, that's, I gotta use that one, okay. All right, this ought to be really easy for everybody, okay? You know it will be, right? Oops, excuse me. Ha, somebody just got that. I have to stick those together because you know, it's kind of an important one. Oops, there's another one. Yes, but, okay, here we go. I thought I was going to do this. Do you like the uh, display of technology that I'm convincing tonight? I put this on PowerPoint, but okay. Here, let's let's see. No, I did. Here we go. Uh, let's see. Let's start with that one. I am not a person, but I am out to destroy everything the rebels are fighting against. Empire. The empire. Oh, the empire. Okay, who's who's that? Antagonist. No. No, I like it. Let's put it there. Okay, empire. All right. Um, and here, you get to read the one that's cut because. Uh... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> the one below it. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Join me, and together we'll rule the galaxy as father and son. Contagonist. Darth Vader. Darth Vader. And he is? Contagonist. Isn't that interesting? When you put him here, it puts a whole different light on him, doesn't it? Okay, so if that's the case, well, let's <coughs> Okay, so we have, here, you can be the contagonist. And let's see, you are the, but wait, there's more. <laughs> well, you can't have that one. It's the wrong source. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Yep. There you go. All right. Let's start with you. I'm a farm boy dreaming of adventure among the stars. My aunt and uncle got wiped out by the Empire, and now I'm out, of, out to exact both revenge and to find my place in the rebellion. I want to be a Jedi. Oh, yeah, fine. Okay, fine. <laughs> oh, I'm okay, you are the what? Protagonist. Okay. I'm good with that. All right. How about you? Uh, should I give him this to him? Or? I read this one. Oh, never mind. Who are you? Oh, yeah, never mind. Take that away. What's the matter? Oh, that's right. I'll give you this one instead. Oh, great, good, good. Uh -huh. How did I end up with that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Leia! Can you do it? <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, look, here. <laughs> Anybody here? Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> okay, go for it. <laughs> 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 I tried. I Short for stormtrooper. 
that's fair. Let's get away. How else can you explain the ease of our escape? Not too much. On. Okay, Leia, who is she? Skeptic. Reason. Think about what she said. Listen to the character. You listen to the character, everything she talks about is logical, reasonable. Okay, so we're going to make you reason. Fine. Who we got left? We have droids who help out whenever we can. We believe in Master Luke and would do anything for him. Sidekick. <laughs> Sidekick. But this is not only C-3PO, but this is also R2-D2. I can't listen. So just kind of droids in general. Okay. Which is an interesting point because this means that you don't have to be just one individual character to represent. These are two characters representing one perspective in the story in the same way that the Empire <coughs> represents a galactic body. That it, okay, Jay. Look, magic tricks and hokey religions are no substitute for a good blaster at your side, kid. <laughs> um, Emotion. Who is it? Han, skeptic. Han is the skeptic here. Now, the interesting thing in this structure is that these are opposites. Look at their relationship. Han ain't crazy about the droids. Okay? We have the Empire here. Who are we missing? All right, let's hear it. All right, I'm an old knight from I'm an old knight from a now nearly extinct order. Even though I've, I'm not going to make it to the end of the film, I'll be more powerful than the opponent I could ever imagine. <laughs> okay, who is it? Uh, Obi. Obi Wan, Guardian, which leaves Chewie is emotion. What does? What, think about Chewbacca. He's the one who's always crying. <laughs> He's the one who is concerned about people. In the second film is all worried about everybody. He's it, also the one who rips arms off. Yes, he's also the one who rips arms off. <laughs> now that's pretty emotional. <laughs> okay? So, driver, passenger. In terms of the overall conflict, which we're talking about fighting the Empire, right? Luke fighting the Empire. This is a driver. All of these people are involved directly with the objective plot. But the rest of these people are kind of dragged along. They're passengers in this. I had so much fun with this. Yeah. Well, you know what? We're not, because it's so Okay, thank you, everybody. Everybody give these fine people a hand. Now, I'm going to get literate on you here for just a moment. Yes? So where do the other characters come in, like Yoda and stuff, and you just put them in the same categories in, just like redo it? In terms of the second film, yes. Okay. But especially because if you look at the all overall series, it's a different line structure. And the players change in the overall structure of the story. Yes? If multiple characters can serve as um, one character type and one character serves, or one person serves as multiple character type. Absolutely. There are, no, I can't get into that right now. <laughs> <laughs> there, are actually, there are actually two sets of these eight structures, okay? that mirror each other because one set deals with action, how they act, and the other with how they think, each of which has their own structure or their own qualities. I was going to get into that, but it's going to take a quick here all night. Yes? Does the, does, uh, does the impact here drop people with the driver here? 
No. As a matter of fact, some of the most interesting stories have a main character who is a passenger character. And let's do this really quickly, okay? Um, the, we teach this full structure in the course, but um, for our purposes tonight, we can work with this, okay? Um, we're going to do a different story here. And I need you to think back because maybe it's been a while since you thought about this story. Or maybe, like me, it's one of your favorite stories. I don't know. Kill a Mockingbird, one of the greatest pieces of modern American literature, taught to everybody. Who are the characters in Kill a Mockingbird? It's not with the emotion. Well, let's run over here. Scout. Who else? Atticus. Atticus. Who? Who? Who else? Um, Scout's brother. Tom Robinson. Ella May Yule. Um, the Mockingbird. The Mockingbird. No, there's no one. <laughs> um, her father. What's her father's name? Bob. Mr. Yule. Mr. Yule. No, Bob Yule, I guess. Bob Yule. One, two, three, four, five, six. We also have Alpernia, who's the maid. We've also got um, let's see. Yeah, okay. And, oh, um, Dill. Go, uh, Dill. Uh, the, uh, uh, oh, oh, and the brother. What's the brother's name? Uh, um, Jim. Jim. Okay. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, oh, we got nine. Two of them are combined. <coughs> uh, hernia represents faith and belief, and also Dill. Both of these represent the qualities of sidekick. Usually when you have two characters that are representing one quality, they are splitting characteristics between them, and they become what we call shallow characters. If you think about Calpurnia and Dill, they're not around that much, and they're not that interesting. This is why. What is the objective story in Kill a Mockingbird. What is the story of this town as seen if you just walked into it? The trial. The trial is the big story. That is the objective story. So if the trial is the objective story for these characters, then who is the guardian? Atticus is the guardian because the driver characters all deal with the objective story, right? Atticus, he is the man who is trying to defend Tom. Tom Robinson in To Kill a Mockingbird is the protagonist. He is the hero and he fails. He is fighting against the general prejudice of the time, certainly, but specifically against Bob Yule. And who is this? Do you remember the story? I guess Ellen May. Yeah. May Ellen Yule. Do you remember what the trial was about? The trial was about Tom Robinson assaulting May Ellie Yule. But the truth was that May Ella had asked him to come in and made a pass at him, a black man in the South. 
And that was a story that no one could buy. So Mayella lies about it. She has her own agenda. She has her own outcome. And if you look at the structure, Atticus goes after her because that is his real form. And these are the two who are at odds. But that's not the story, is it? The story is about who? And it's about a scout and her brother. Who is the main character in this story? Yeah. Yeah. Scout. She is a passenger in this story. Who is the impact character in this story? Moo Randall, who is also a passenger character. This, this structurally, is why Kill a Mockingbird is so meaningful. Because they feel like passengers so much swept along the events. This is the structure. This is why To Kill a Mockingbird is such a great story. What does this mean for you? <laughs> <laughs> my, my experience so far with role-playing games and with computer games in general has been that they are excellent at portraying this. They expect the user to assume this role. All right? Where computer games have traditionally failed in storytelling is here. Because there is no impact character. challenge the player on an emotional level, on a personal level, and to drive with this, this relationship in this life. Until computer games can find a way, until computer simulation can find a way to do this, they will be incomplete in their portrayal of the story. They will be incomplete in their ability to meaningfully impact the audience. Why should you care? Now, Yes, uh, first of all, it's going back to the main character types. Mm -hmm. For example, in Star Wars, uh, we can feel all the other characters in uh, different spots, but not the protagonist, or we can have two protagonists depending on like, many stories of how does that work. So we, we have, like, for example, Jar Jar Binks. So <coughs> like emotion. Actually, I sure think if the analysis were done on Jar Jar Binks, <laughs> I'd rid the character altogether. <laughs> But we do have we do have a lot of different characters. If you analyze each story individually, I think that what you're going to find is that you have a rough journey between them. Which is why Star Wars on the whole feels a little uncomfortable. Um, because you have to start losing characters really Yeah, exactly. So um, so yeah, in each in each film, that you have a specific structure, but then when you start analyzing in terms of the overall structure, it starts to fall apart because they didn't plan for that. Anyway, you had another question. Christian, uh, in games, what you're trying to do is to involve the character, like the player, with the character, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> to make him like 
kill is the one there. So it sounds contradictory if you have a sidekick, for example. Right? You control the sidekick, the sidekick, and then you, you deliver the protagonist or something like that? Yes. Um, I was thinking about the limited matrix and this as well. The I'll get back to you. Don't worry. Okay. Yes. Um, I think Fallout would be actually a good example of a limited matrix. Uh, and you can actually choose companions in that game, and I think the companions actually can, uh, depending on what ending you're going for in the game, you can fill those boxes with companions in the game. Uh, well, and then I look at, I'm sorry, what was the game you looked for in time? Fallout. Uh, Fallout, yes. I'm playing the new Vegas. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and how narrow you make that particular matrix, of course, depends on how, how tight you want to draw that. Um, Bioshock, for example, really didn't. It was very much a march through linear matrix structure. It had different set pieces that you could move through, but you know, the big deal about that was supposed to be that you'd have like multiple endings. Well, multiple endings in that case turned out to be two. <laughs> and I guess that qualifies for multiple, but it wasn't really what I had in mind. <laughs> But to come back to your question, in terms of the game, we all want to be the protagonist, or or a spoiler, sometimes, um, depending on the type of player that you have playing. There, I think there are probably four different types of players, uh, basically. Um, there's the uh, there's the fighter. Um, if it moves, kill it. If it doesn't move, kick it till it moves. <laughs> um, buy bigger weapons, kill bigger stuff. Okay. Now, for those kind of characters, by the way, you put them in an arena and they're happy. Seriously. But you know, the second kind of player is uh, the social kind of player. Uh, if it moves, talk to it. If it doesn't move, talk about it. <laughs> uh, speak with an affected voice and be in character. Um, for that kind of player, if you, if you get a group of exclusively that kind of player, you put them all in a tavern, you get them talking in character, and you go out for pizza, uh, they'll still be there when you get back. <laughs> Third kind of player is type A player. He's the player who wants to know the objective to win the game. And he'll talk to people if it will help him win the game. He will fight things if it will help him win the game. He'll, he likes puzzles and traps that represent obstacles between him and winning the game. And the fourth kind of player was suggested to me by Richard Garriott, which was uh, the spoiler player, the guy who just wants to break it. <laughs> uh, in a matrix like this, you'd be in one corner, he'd be in the other. <clears throat> At least he sees himself that way. Okay. Yes? In kind of a related question to what he had, what about a generational? Like the stories, I'm trying to remember the series that I read a while ago. But each time, each book that came out, it was a new generation mm -hmm. of characters and heroes and whatnot. I wrote a book like that, actually. I wrote a series like that with my wife. Uh, the Red Ball series is good. Yeah. And my series, uh, my uh, Mystic, uh, or my uh, Bronze Canicle series, with my wife. You wrote that? that I, I, read, I read that series. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I thank you, my mortgage maker. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and that was a generational book as well. It was unpopular because people didn't like starting over with new characters all the time. They found that <coughs> yes. So coming back to Tolkien um, yes. and the concepts you're talking about where in order to really um, make this work inside the storyline in the way if the player is what we're having assumed the role as the main character as our primary, uh, our primary character. And the real objective of the game in order to be a proper storytelling vessel is to have our impact character be um, one of the more important characters that goes along with it. I mean, Tolkien is a good example of this because you have the main character, which is Frodo, but really the story in the very end ends up a lot more about Sam and his battle and his progression and, his, and what he goes through. And, but he's the impact character for Frodo. Uh, and you, 
you really align with him much more, and he becomes a much more important entity. So is that what we're looking for? Are we looking to build a main character that the player can be the Frodo, and then have a storyline prop piece where they are the Sam that goes along and allows the Frodo to achieve? I think so, initially I think so. But I also think that this kind of structure would also work for it to be a very interesting one as well, if you could achieve it. I think, I think my challenge here for you is, is the idea of these two lines that are completely missing right now from, from, from gaming. And because they're missing from the gaming, they don't achieve a level of meaning for the participant that they could. Good first, yes. Yeah. The you mentioned that the particular mockingbird structure, I don't know if that's what you're referring to, but yeah. that would be interesting for a game to achieve. It cheaper. seems like to me though, like let's say you're a scout, you don't really affect the objective plot. So if you're a gamer and you Everything you do doesn't affect the objective plot line. Then, then you're being dragged around by the nose. Yeah, that's not fun. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, right? so yeah. which is. <laughs> 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 I'm hurt. Come on. That's that's right. Which is why I think in terms of gaming, we need to stick with the protagonist character in terms of the of the participant himself. Yes. So I was just going to say. I mean, it seems like it'd be you know, backstory cutscene in a lot of games, there is these aspects where, you know, there's an impact character, you know, in Final Fantasy VII, I read, you know, this. That there, Iris, you know, dies and is an impact character for the main character cloud. But none of that is, is it, it doesn't seem to affect the actual game because the cutscenes and the gameplay are somehow destroyed. It seems almost like I think it's oil and water, and that's almost a problem for more than probably to add an extra theme in the game. Or maybe it's possible to add it to the game itself. I think that at least if you have the game itself, sticking in a cutscene doesn't have the impact that it has with my participation in the game. My participation in the game. You know, do, I, do I sacrifice this other character, or do I? Yeah. 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 Yes. What form would a powerful impact character take in gameplay? Because we can easily envision it in like a cutscene or just a story going around, going on around, or dialogue or something like that. But how does it take place in the gameplay, in combat, or whatever? As an impact character? Well, you're talking about establishing an emotional connection between the player and uh, essentially a construct. It's like Resident Evil 4, using a girl as an example, would be good. As you play through the game, how she's being traumatized. Wouldn't that be an impact character? In it could be, uh, but but for me, I would like to see that to have some. In that case, I, I want to see the subjective line. What is the emotional line between the player and that particular character that we're trying to achieve? Yes. There's this uh, one game. I'm not sure if you've heard of it. It's called Advent Rising. It's uh, the it actually had a screenplay written by Orson Scott Card. And it was interesting because uh, I, I wonder if it does kind of have it's it's a very linear, a very linear storyline, but it does, I think it does kind of have that like, um, as you're playing through, you have uh, you have the fiance and then his brother, mm -hmm. and and like what happens is, you uh, at this one point you you're like trying to get onto an escape shuttle, and you have to pick between one of the two. Has like it does have like a minor impact on the actual story, but um, but you end up choosing one between one of the others, and what ends up happening is is towards the end of the game you actually end up fighting against the one that you uh, what didn't pick. What I'm suggesting to you, what I'm suggesting to you, Richard Garrett, I get so much wisdom. Um, there hasn't been a serious major advance in terms of game itself in 20 years. Games have inflated in size, but they haven't really changed. Their graphics have improved, their modeling has improved, the physics within them have improved, but the actual 
play itself hasn't changed. Yes? So, one of the things I get from, from this is when you talk about uh, your structure, we have eight character types. You have the through lines that follow main characters and back characters. Um, the thing I get from that is, you know, kind of going back to something that Chris Crawford has said, which is the stories are about people, relationships among people. And so, I think what we're seeing in games is that we don't focus on relationships in the game, we focus on objects and blowing up objects. Mm -hmm. So, if, um, if we're going to try to get some meaning from games, we have to you know, focus on people and relationships. And the problem is that there's no, there's no effective way of interacting in games that, that can produce the type of you know, sophisticated relationships that, that produce meaning like this. I don't believe that. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll tell you why. Awesome. I'll tell you why. I'm going to tell you, sir, I, I know I'm over and I apologize for that. Because I, I've had so much to present um, for you here tonight. Um, but I'm, I want you to think about this story. Okay? I want you to think about this story. When, when I first went uh, to TSR, Wizards of the uh, Hasbro, whoever they <laughs> When I first went to TSR, I wanted to tell stories in games. When I came into the company, the company had just done a huge study. Paid a lot of money. That's what you did in the 80s. You paid a lot of money and did a study done in the And the results came back after all money had been spent. And the report was boiled down to this. Dungeons and Dragons is your core business. You have lots of dungeons. More dragons. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this report came out just about the time I came into the company, and so they were looking for <laughs> dragons. And it just so happened that I'd be with the company, and, and having driven my young family across the plains the other way than the rest of my ancestors, <laughs> I um, wanted very desperately to bring something to the company that was worthwhile. So I came up as we were crossing the plains in our little Volkswagen rabbit with this idea of people riding dragons into war. And it was there with my wife who came up with the title Dragon Lines. Mostly out of desperation. <laughs> we came to TSR and while we were there we started, uh, we, st we proposed the Dragon Lines project as part of this initiative for more dragons. And interestingly enough, they bought it. <laughs> um, I met Margaret Weiss while we were there. We were not supposed to write books. We had hired somebody else to write those books because we needed to hire somebody who's a real writer as opposed to someone you know. But the material that this writer was submitting were just not what we had in mind. And so on one weekend, Margaret and I, having determined that the story was really ours, wrote the prologue in the first five chapters of what now is known as Dragon's Law of the We took it into the company, and the, and the editor read it while we waited in Margaret's cubicle, sweating. <laughs> and she came out and said, this is exactly what we wanted. So they paid off the other guy, which meant that we didn't get an advance. But it did give us a very small work. So we started to write Dragonlance, and Dragonlance uh, quickly became very popular. And we were into the second book, and we were writing a section of the book in the High Paris Tower. And in this tower, it sits in this valley between, between the hordes of evil and the great beautiful city. There was a character by the name of Sturm. And Sturm, who everyone thought was a knight of this ancient order, but when we get to this great tower where the actual knight exists, it's discovered that he actually isn't one of their number, that in fact he stole his father's armor and has been posing all this time. This so upsets the order of knighthood that they won't even listen to him or accept him. He's a pariah among the people that he wants to 
help them lost. But in the story, as the terrible, evil hordes are charging across the great plain, dragons and their riders are <coughs> coming to destroy the tower. And all of this ancient night that flees the wall. This night, he starts to proceed, stands on the wall, faces the dragon alone, and dies. The sentence, disturbs the sun shadow, and I read it and wept. He's just a This was back in 1983. And the years rolled by, and the books went out, and were published in this form, that form. And the decades passed. And it was only a few years ago, a couple of years ago, when Margaret and I were on a book tour. And one of our book tour stops was in uh, Fort Lewis, Washington, at the PX there. And the, the administrator of the PX said, this is going to be a different kind of a book signing. So these people who are in line here, these are about these are men who are about to be fallen. They're going to Iraq and some of them in Afghanistan, and some of them are not coming back. There are wives and children who are here to get their books signed for their loved ones who may or may not be coming back. So we went out, there were about 500 people here, and, and you get into a rhythm. If someone has experienced your work, it's a personal thing for them. And they know, they're smart people, they know they've only got about a minute, two minutes maybe with you, to express everything they felt from your art. And from my side of the table, after you've had 50, 60, 70 of these impactful, emotional, charged moments, you get into a rhythm. Because every one of them needs their moment. You have to use them. You get in a rhythm, you take the book, how are you? What's the name? May I sign? What was your favorite character? You enjoyed the book. Thank you. Pass it on. And I reached across the table and I picked up this dog ear cover falling off copy of. Annotated Chronicle, the annotated collection of Chronicles. Oh, excuse me, it was not the annotated collection. It was the omnibus edition. White, soft cover, nearly missing. And I looked across the table, and here was this young man in a wheelchair. And he said to me, this book has been written jumped from 30,000. I've taken this book with me hundreds of feet out of the ocean. It's gone everywhere. Then he said, then he said, I was in Afghanistan and I got shot. <coughs> it turns out he was hit in the spine. More back. Dropping. And when I went down, my first thought was, what would Stern do? Second thought, he said, 
said, told me later was, I hope this works out better for you. <laughs> <laughs> This young man, with a shattered back, stood up and warned his squad. And he said to me across the table, this book saved 12 men's lives that day. And then he reached across the table and he handed us his bronze star Purple heart. I keep those on my desk to remind me of why I do what I do. Maybe you think of yourself as creating the version. But if you can imbue your heart with meaning, you will change the world. That's what I hope you take now. Thank you. teach story structure, I teach writing, I do critiques, and I also teach serial publishing on the web, which is something I'm doing. I, uh, yeah. Are you on LinkedIn as well? I may be on, yes, I believe I am. You should be able to find me there. I'm also on Facebook. You can find me there. I'm also, I also tweet. <laughs> you can find me there. And I'll tell you what, let me see here what I've got in my bag. Sorry about that. Oh no, we're fine. Any of those brown skin pills? No, have you ever seen this? Even tied. This, I'll tell you about it while I'm looking for my stuff here. Um, This is um, this is a book that I did with my wife on the internet as serial publishing. We got subscribers online. There we, go. Um, we got subscribers online. They got chapters every week through a secure website. There's a forum there so they can discuss it. They also posted editorial remarks about my text, <laughs> which was great because I didn't have to pay somebody to do it for me. <laughs> Having whitewashed the fence with these good people, just like Tom Sawyer, the story, the, the, the pitch on this book is, what's that? If they subscribed to the book and got a chapter every week, at the end of the chapters, when all the chapters were released, we mailed to every subscriber this hardback edition of the book. And uh, so everyone is numbered, everyone is signed. I know who owns each one. And the coolest thing about this of all is that because they subscribed up front, it didn't cost me anything out of pocket. So, uh, I already knew ahead of time what size print 
So it's actually a new way of publishing that uh, I've been pioneering. I also teach that. So anyway, what I was going to say is the website is right here. I also have a few of these bookmarks, which I'd be happy to sign for you. It's got a coupon code on it for like a 20% discount. Woo! <laughs> so uh, anyway, that's available to you if you want to. Anyway, thank you. Let's give them another round of applause.